The morning of Arista Essendon's trial arrived along with the first snow. <sighs> Despite not having slept, Percy Braga did not feel the least bit tired. Having set the wheels in motion the previous morning by sending the trial announcements, he had a hundred details demanding his personal attention. He was just rechecking his witness list when there was a knock at the door to his office, and a servant entered. <coughs> I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Bishop Solder is here. He told me you wanted to see him. Oh, of course, of course. Send him in. The elderly cleric entered, wearing his dress robes of black and red. Braga crossed the room and kissed his ring as he bowed. Thank you for seeing me so early, Your Grace. Are you hungry? May I arrange for some breakfast? No, thank you. I've already eaten. At my age, one tends to wake early whether one wants to or not. What exactly did you want to see me about? I just wanted to make sure you didn't have any questions about your testimony today. We could go over it now, if you do. I've scheduled some time. Ah, oh, I see. The bishop nodded slowly. I don't think that will be necessary. I have a clear understanding of what is required. Wonderful. Then I think everything is in order. Excellent. The bishop glanced toward the decanter. <gasps> is that brandy, I see? Yes. Would you like some? Well, normally I wouldn't indulge so early, but this is a special occasion. Absolutely, Your Grace. The bishop took a seat near the fire as Braga poured two glasses of brandy and handed one to him. To the new Melengar regime. There's just something about a bit of brandy on a snowy day. Salder had white hair and gentle-looking eyes. Sitting in the glow of the fire, casually cupping the glass in his wrinkled hand, he appeared the quintessential kind-hearted grandfather. Braga knew better. He could not have risen to his present position without being ruthless. As bishop, Solder was one of the chief officers of the Nephron Church and the ranking clergy in the kingdom of Melangar. He worked and resided in the great Mare's Cathedral, an edifice just as imposing as, and certainly more beloved than, Essendon Castle. As far as influence was concerned, Braga estimated that of the 19 bishops who comprised the leadership of the faithful, Salder must be in the top three. How long before the trial? Uh, we'll begin in about an hour or so. I must say, you've handled this very well, Percy. The church is quite pleased. Our investment in you was substantial, but it would appear we made a wise choice. When dealing with timetables as long as we are, it's difficult to be sure we put the right people in place. I must admit I had some doubts about you. Braga raised an eyebrow. I'm surprised to hear you say that. Well, you didn't look as though you had the makings of a king when we arranged your marriage to Amrath's sister. You were a scrawny, pretentious little... That was nearly 20 years ago. True enough. However, at the time, all I noticed about you was your skill with the sword and your staunch imperialist view. I was afraid that being so young, you might... Well, who knew if you'd stay loyal? But you proved me wrong. You've grown into an able administrator, and your ability to adapt in the face of unexpected events, like this sudden timetable shift Arista caused, proves your capability to manage problems effectively. Well, I'll admit it hasn't gone exactly as I planned. Ulrich's escape was unexpected. I clearly underestimated the princess. But at least she was good enough to provide me a convenient means to implicate her. So, exactly what are you planning to do about Arista's little brother? Do you know where he is? Yes, he is at Drondel Fields. I have several reports of the mustering of Galilin. Troops are converging at Pickering's castle. And you're not concerned about that? Let's just say I wish I could have caught the little brat before he reached Pickering. But I'll be turning my attentions to him as soon as I conclude with his sister. I hope to take care of him before he can bolster too much support. He's been quite elusive. He slipped through my fingers at the Weissand Ford. 
I thought he would be easy to find, and I had scores of troops watching every road, valley, and village. But for several days, he just vanished. Ah, and that, when he got through to Pickering? Oh, no, I actually managed to catch him. A patrol picked him up at the Silver Pitcher Inn. Then I don't understand. Why isn't he here? Because my patrol never came back. An advance rider brought the news Ulrich was captured, but the rest of them disappeared. I investigated and heard some amazing rumors. According to my reports, two men traveling with the prince organized the locals and staged an ambush on the men bringing Ulrich in. Do you know who these two men were who came to Ulrich's aid? I have no names, but the prince called them his royal protectors. I'm certain, however, they're the same two thieves I set up to take the blame for Amrath's death. Somehow, the prince has managed to retain their services. He must have offered them riches, perhaps even land and title. The boy is more clever than I thought. But no matter. I have made adequate arrangements for him and his friends. I've been bolstering the ranks of the Melangar army for the last several weeks with mercenaries loyal to my money. Amrath never knew. One of the perks of being the Lord Chancellor is not having to get the royal seal on all orders. The servant once again entered. <clears throat> the Earl of Chadwick is here to see you, my lord. Archibald Ballantyne? What is he doing here? Get rid of him. No, no, wait. I asked the Earl to come. Please, send him in. The servant bowed and left. I wish you had discussed this with me. Forgive me, Your Grace, but I have too much going on today to entertain a visit from a neighboring noble. Yes, yes, I know you are quite busy, but the church has its own matters to attend to. The Earl of Chadwick possesses a certain interest to us. He is young, ambitious, and easily impressed by success. It will do him good to see firsthand just what kinds of things are possible with the right friends. Besides, having an ally on your southern border has benefits for you as well. Are you suggesting I try and sway him away from King Ethelred? Ethelred is a good imperialist, I admit. But there can be only one emperor. There's no reason it couldn't be you. Assuming you continue to prove yourself worthy, Ballantyne has many assets that could help in that endeavor. I'm not even king yet, and you're talking emperor? <laughs> the church hasn't lasted for 3,000 years by not thinking ahead. Oh, here he is. Come in. Come in, Archibald. Archibald Ballantyne entered, brushing the snow from his cloak and stomping his feet. Toss your cloak aside and come to the fire. Warm up, lad. The carriage ride must have been a cold one. Archibald crossed the room and kissed the ring of the still-seated bishop. Good morning, your grace. He turned and bowed graciously to the archduke. Uh, my lord. He swept off his cloak and shook it out carefully. Perplexed, he looked around. Uh, your servant left before taking my cloak. Just throw it anywhere. The earl looked at Braga, aghast. This is imported damask with gold thread embroideries. Just then, the servant re-entered with a large, comfortable chair. Ah, there you are. Here, take this, and for Mirabo's sake, don't hang it from a peg. He passed his cloak to the servant, who bowed and left. Brandy? Oh, good lord, yes. I appreciate your coming, Archibald. I'm afraid we won't have much time to talk just now. There is quite a bit of turmoil in Melengar today, but, as I was telling Braga, I thought it might be beneficial for the three of us to have a quick chat. I'm always at your service, of course, Your Grace. I appreciate any opportunity to meet with you and the new king of Melengar. Salder and Braga exchanged looks. Oh, come now, it can hardly be a secret. You are the Archduke and Lord Chancellor. With King Amrath and the prince dead, if you execute Arista, you'll wear the crown. It's really rather nicely done. I commend you. Murder in broad daylight, right before the nobles. They'll cheer you on as you steal their crown. Braga stiffened. Are you accusing me of... Of course not. I accuse no one. What care do I have for the affairs of Melinga? 
My liege is Ethelred of Warwick. What happens in your kingdom is none of my affair. I was merely offering my sincere congratulations. He raised his glass and nodded at the bishop. To both of you. Braga and Salder watched the young earl closely. Do you have a name for this game, Valentine? Archibald smiled again. My dear gentlemen, I'm playing no game. I'm being truthful when I say I'm simply in awe. All the more because of my own recent failure. You see, I tried to gamble myself to increase my station, only it was less than successful. Braga became quite amused with this primly dressed earl. He understood what the bishop saw in him, and he was curious now. I'm very sorry to hear you suffered difficulties. Exactly what were you attempting? Well, I acquired some letters and tried to blackmail the Marquis of Gloucester into marrying his daughter to me so I could obtain his Ryland Valley. I had the messages locked in my safe in my private tower and was prepared to present them to Victor in person. Everything was perfect, but poof, the letters vanished like a magic trick. What happened to them? They were stolen. Thieves sawed a hole in the roof of my tower, and in just a matter of minutes, slipped in and snatched them from underneath my very nose. Impressive. Depressing is what it was. They made me look like a fool. Did you catch the thieves? Sadly, no. But I finally figured out who they are. It took me days to reason it out. I did not tell anyone I possessed those letters. So the only ones who could have taken them are the same thieves which I hired in the first place cunning devils. They call themselves Raira. I'm not sure why they stole them. Perhaps they plan to charge me twice, but I won't give them the satisfaction, of course. I'll hire someone else to intercept the next set from the Wind's Abbey. So, the letters you had were correspondences between the Marquis of Gloucester and King Amrath? Archibald looked at the bishop, surprised. Interesting guess, your grace. No. They were love letters, between his daughter and her nationalist lover, Gaunt. I planned to have Alenda marry me instead, to spare Victor the embarrassment of his daughter being involved with a commoner. <laughs> have I said something funny? Oh, you had more in your hands than you knew. Those weren't love letters, and they weren't to dig and Gaunt. With all due respect, Your Grace, I had the letters in my possession. They were addressed to him. I'm sure they were, but that was merely a precaution against someone like you discovering them. It was quite clever, actually. It makes a fine diversion, should someone intercept the letters. Deegan Gaunt, as a lover, I suspect, is meant to represent Lanaklin's desire for revolution against Ethelred. If the Marquis stated his opinions openly, he would risk execution. Those letters were actually coded messages from Victor Lenaclin sent by Alenda to a messenger of King Amrath. The Marquis of Gloucester is a traitor to his kingdom and the imperialist cause. Had you realized, you could have had all of Gloucester and Victor's head as a wedding gift. How do you know? Archduke Braga learned of the meetings when the late king asked him to pay the messenger directly and without record. He, of course, told me. Archibald stood silent and then swallowed the rest of the brandy in one mouthful. But wait, why tell you? Because, as a good imperialist, Percy here knows the importance of keeping the church informed of such things. Archibald looked at Braga, puzzled. But you're a royalist aren't you? I mean, how could the Lord Chancellor of Melengar be an imperialist? Hmm, how indeed. By marrying into the royal family. The church has been surreptitiously placing imperialists in key positions near the throne of nearly every royalist kingdom in Avron and even a few in the nations of Trent and Calais. Through unusual accidents, these men have managed to find themselves rulers of most of those realms. The church feels that when the heir is finally found, it will help make a smoother transition if all the various kingdoms are already prepared to pledge their allegiance. Incredible. Indeed. I must warn you, however, that you won't be able to obtain additional letters 
There will be no more meetings at the Winds Abbey. Regrettably, I was forced to ask the Archduke to teach the monks a lesson for hosting such meetings. The Abbey was burned along with the monks. You killed your fellow shepherds of Meribor's flock? When Meribor sent Novran to us, it was as a warrior to destroy our enemies. Our god is not squeamish at the sight of spilled blood, and it's often necessary to prune weak branches to keep the trees strong. Killing the monks was uh, a necessity, but I did spare one, the son of Lenaclin, so he could return home and let his father know the deaths were on his hands. We can't have royalists organizing against us, can we? Salder smiled at Archibald. The elderly cleric took another sip of his drink. The moment passed, and once more Braga observed the persona of the saintly grandfather. So, you were after Gloucester, Archibald? Braga refilled the Earl's glass. Perhaps I misjudged you. Tell me, my dear Earl, were you more upset you lost the land? Or a lender. Archibald waved his hand in the air as if he were shooing a fly. She was merely an added benefit. It's the land I wanted. I see. Braga glanced at Salder, who smiled and nodded. You may still get it. With me on the throne of Melengar, I'll want a strong imperialist ally guarding my southern border with Warwick. King Ethelred would call that treason. And what would you call it? Archibald smiled and drummed his fingernails on the beautiful cut crystal of the royal brandy glass. Opportunity. Braga sat back down and stretched out his feet to the fire. I would welcome Ethelred engaging me personally. I already have a standing veteran army and a number of mercenaries at the ready. I'll be able to muster superior numbers should that prove necessary. The result will be that he would lose all of Warwick. And that could provide me the keys to the rest of Averon and perhaps all of Apeladorn. My, but I do appreciate your ability to think big. I can see there would be many advantages to my joining with you. Do you really have your sights on the title of Emperor? Why not? If I'm poised to conquer, the Patriarch will be eager to throw his allegiance to me, just as the Church did with Glen Morgan. If I promise certain rights to the church, he may even declare me the heir. Then no one will stand against me. In any case, this is for another day. We are getting ahead of ourselves. Braga turned his attention toward the bishop. I want to thank you, Your Grace, for arranging this meeting. It was very educational. But now it's nearly mid-morning, and I think it's time to get Arista's trial underway. I would, however, like to invite you to stay, Archibald. As it turns out, I think I may be able to offer you a gift to show you my commitment to you as a newfound friend of Melengar. I'm flattered, my lord. I'd welcome the opportunity to spend time with you, and I'm sure whatever gift you may have will be a generous one. You mentioned the thieves who spoiled your move against Victor Lenaclin called themselves Raira? Yes, I did. Why do you ask? Well, it appears we share a common interest in these two rogues. They have also been a rather painful thorn in my own side. As you already discovered, they pay no respect to people who hire them and are willing to turn against their employers. I, too, hired them for a task and now find them working against me. I have reason to believe they may be coming here today, and I have set plans in motion to capture them. If they do indeed make an appearance, I'll try them along with Arista. It's quite possible all three will be burning at the stake by early evening. Archibald nodded his head and smiled. You are indeed most generous, my lord. I thought you might enjoy that. You mentioned when you arrived that Ulrich is dead, and that's indeed the notion I've been circulating. Unfortunately, it's not so. That is, not yet. Arista actually arranged for those thieves to smuggle Ulrich out of this castle on the night of Amrath's death. I believe he has hired them, and they will attempt to save her. Evidence indicates they used the sewers to exit the castle, so I've taken extra precautions there. 
The grate in the kitchen has been sealed, and Wylan, the captain of the castle guard, waits with his best men hidden to close the river grate behind them. I even failed to post guards near there to make it more enticing. With luck, the fool of a prince might actually play the boyish hero and come with them. If he does, checkmate. Archibald nodded with obvious pleasure. You really are very impressive. Braga raised his glass in tribute. To me. To you. Archibald drank to Braga's health. <sighs> Come. One of Braga's hired soldiers burst into the room. Lord Chancellor. His cheeks and nose were red, his armor dripping wet. On his head and shoulders a small bit of snow remained. Yes, what is it? The wall guard reports footprints in the snow leading to the river near the sewers, my lord. Excellent. Braga drained his glass. Take eight men and support Captain Wyland from the river. I don't want them escaping. Remember, if the prince is with them, kill him on sight. Don't let Wyland stop you. Either way, I want the thieves alive. Lock them in the dungeons and gag them as before. I'll use them as further incriminating evidence against Arista and burn the whole lot together. The soldier bowed and left. Now, gentlemen, as I was saying, let's join the magistrate and the other nobles. I'm anxious to get this trial underway. They all stood, and walking three abreast, they exited the large double doors as one. The morning sun, magnified by the snow, entered the river grate as a stark white light. The wintry radiance splintered along the glistening ceiling, revealing ancient stone caked in mildew and moss. The frozen sweat of the sewer walls reflected the light, bouncing it back and forth until at last it scattered into the all-consuming darkness. In the gloom, the soldiers waited, crouching in cold. Their feet were ankle-deep in filthy cold water, which streamed between their legs, running from the castle drains to the river. For the better part of four hours, they lingered in silence, but now they could hear the sound of footsteps approaching. The sloshing of the dirty water echoed off the sewer walls, and the distant movement of shadows played upon the stone. With a motion of his hand, Wylan ordered his troops to hold their position and maintain their silence. He wanted to be certain the rear guard was in place, and his prey was in sight before he made his move. There were many avenues in the sewers where two men could run and hide in the dark. He did not want to be chasing the rats through a maze of tunnels. Not only was it unpleasant down there, but Wyland knew the Archduke wanted the thieves for the morning festivities and would not be pleased with a long delay. Soon they came into view. Two men, one tall and broad, the other shorter and slimmer, dressed in warm winter cloaks with hoods pulled high, rounded the corner slowly. Wyland waved his arm. Move in! Take them! Now! The castle guard rushed from their positions in an adjoining tunnel and charged the two men. From behind, more soldiers raced forward, blocking any retreat. The troops encircled the two, swords drawn and shields at the ready. Careful. The Archduke says they are full of surprises. One of the soldiers from the rear stepped forward. I'll show you surprises. He struck the tall one with the pommel of his sword, dropping him. Another used his shield, and the second man fell unconscious. Wylan glared at his ranks, then shrugged. Uh, I was planning on letting them walk, but this works too. Chain them, gag them, and drag them to the dungeons. And for Meribor's sake, get their heads up before they drown. Braga wants them alive. The soldiers nodded and went to work. This hearing of the High Court of Melangar has been assembled in good order to review allegations made against the Princess Arista Azenden by the Lord Chancellor, the Archduke of Melangar, Percy Braga. The voice of the Chief Magistrate boomed across the chamber. Princess Arista stands duly accused of treason against the Crown, the murder of her father and brother, and the practicing of witchcraft. The largest room in the castle, the court of Melangar had a cathedral ceiling, stained glass windows, and walls rimmed in emblems and shields of the noble houses of the kingdom. Bench seats and balconies were overflowing with spectators. The nobles and the city's affluent merchants pressed in to see the royal trial of the princess. 
Outside, many common people had been gathering since dawn and waited in the snow as runners reported the proceedings. A wall of armor-clad soldiers held them at bay. The court itself was a boxed set of bleachers composed of tiered armchairs where the ranking nobles of the kingdom sat. Several of the seats were vacant, but enough had arrived to serve Braga's purpose. Still frosty with the morning chill, most of the court wore fur wraps as they waited for the fire in the great hearth to warm the room. At the front stood the empty throne, its vacancy looming like an ominous specter before the court. Its presence was a stark reminder of the gravity and scope of the trial. The verdict could decide who would sit there next and control the reins of the kingdom. This judicial court, comprised of men of good standing and sound wisdom, will now hear the allegations and the evidence. May Maribor grant them wisdom. The chief magistrate took his seat, and a heavy-set man with a short beard wreathing his small mouth stood up. He was dressed in expensive-looking robes that flowed behind him as he paced before the jury, eyeing each man carefully. Lords of the court! The lawyer addressed the bleachers with a dramatic sweep of his arm. Your noble personages have by now learned that our good King Amrath was murdered seven days past in this very castle. You may also be aware Prince Ulrich is missing, presumed abducted and murdered. But how could such things as these happen within a king's own castle walls? A king might be murdered, a prince might be abducted, but both in the same night and one after the other. How is this possible? How is it possible? that two killers slipped inside the castle unnoticed, stabbed the king to death, and despite being caught and locked in the dungeon, were able to escape. Now this in itself is incredible, because the cell in which they were locked was heavily guarded by skilled soldiers. Not only were they imprisoned, they were also chained by their wrists and ankles to the wall. But. What is beyond amazing, what is beyond belief, is that after managing their miraculous escape, the two did not flee. No, indeed, informed while in captivity that they would be drawn and quartered at dawn, a most painful and gruesome death to be certain, for their most heinous crime, these two killers remained in a castle filled with hundreds of soldiers ready to thrust them back into their cell. Rather than flee for their lives, instead they sought out the prince, the most heavily guarded and high-profile personage in the castle, and kidnapped him. I ask you again, how is this possible? Were the castle guards asleep? Uh, were they so totally incompetent as to let the killers of the king walk out? Or... Could it be that the assassins had help? Could a god have done this? A foreign spy, even a trusted baron or earl? No, none of them would have the authority to enter the dungeon to see the killers of the king, much less free them. Nay, gracious lords, no person in the castle that night had the authority to enter those jails so easily save one. Princess Arista, being the daughter of the victim, who could deny her the right to spit in the faces of the men who murdered her father so brutally? Only she wasn't there to defile the killers. She came to help them finish the job she started. This is an outrage! An elderly man protested from the bleachers. To accuse the poor girl of her father's death! You should be ashamed! Where is she? Why is she not present to dispute these claims? Lord Valen, we are honored to have you with us today. This court will call the princess forth shortly. She is not here for presenting of facts, as it is a, a tedious and unpleasant matter, and this court does not want the princess to endure it. Likewise, those called to testify can speak freely. 
without the presence of their future queen, should she be found innocent. And there are still other, more unpleasant reasons upon which I will elaborate in due time. This did not appear to change Lord Valen's mood, but he made no further protest and sat back down. The court of Melengar calls Reuben Hilfred to testify. The lawyer paused as the big soldier, still dressed in ringmail in the tabard of the falcon, stood before the court. His stance was proud and straight, but his expression was anything but pleased. Hilfred, what is your position here at Essendon Castle? I am personal bodyguard to Princess Arista. Tell us, Reuben, what is your rank? I am sergeant at arms. That's a fairly high rank, isn't it? It is a respected position. How did you attain this rank? Yeah. I was singled out for some reason. For some reason? For some reason? Well, is it not true you were recommended for promotion by Captain Wyland for your years of consistent and unwavering loyalty to the crown? Moreover, is it not true that the king himself appointed you to be his daughter's personal bodyguard after you risked your life and saved Arista from the fire that killed the Queen Mother? Were you not also presented with a commendation for bravery by the king? Are not all these things true? Yes, sir. I sense in you a reluctance to be here, Reuben. I am I correct? Yes, sir. It is because you are loyal to your princess and you do not wish to be a part of anything which might harm her. Well, that is an admirable quality. Still, you are also an honorable man, and as such, you must speak truthfully in your testimony before this court. So, tell us, Reuben. What happened the night the king was murdered? Hilfred shifted his weight uncomfortably from one foot to the other, and then took a breath. It was light, and the princess was asleep in her bed. I was on post at the tower stairs when the king was found. Captain Wyland ordered me to check on Princess Arista. Before I reached her door, she came out startled by the noise. How was she dressed? In a gown. I'm, I'm not sure which. But she was dressed, was she not? Not in a robe or nightclothes? Yes, she was dressed. You have spent years guarding Arista. Have you ever known her to sleep in her gowns? No. Never? Never. But I assume you have no doubt stood outside her door when she went to dress for meals or to change after traveling. Does she have servants to help her dress? Yes. How many? Three. And. How long is the fastest you recall her dressing? Um, I am not certain. Well, make a guess. The court will not hold you to the exact time. Perhaps 20 minutes. 20 minutes with three servants. Hmm, that is actually quite fast, considering all the ties and toggles that require lacing for most ladies' clothing. Now, how long would you say it was between the discovery of the king's body and the time the princess came out of her room. Hilfred hesitated. How long? Perhaps ten minutes. Ten minutes, you say? And when she came out of her room, how many servants were with her? None that I saw. <gasps> Amazing! The princess woke up unexpectedly in the dark and managed to dress herself fully in a lavish gown in ten minutes without the help of a single servant. The lawyer paced the floor, his head down in thought, a finger tapping his lips. He paused with his back to Hilfred. Then, as if a sudden thought occurred to him, he spun abruptly. Tell us, how did she take the news of the king's death? She was shocked. Did she weep? I am sure she did. But did you see her? No. Mm. Then what happened? She went to Prince Ulrich's chambers to find him and was surprised he was not there. Uh, she then... Uh, 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 please stop there, just a minute. She went to Ulrich's chambers? She learns her father is murdered, and her first inclination is to go to her brother's room. Did you not find it odd she did not immediately rush to her father's side? After all... No one had suggested any harm had come to Ulrich, had they? No. What happened next? She went to view her father's body, and Ulrich arrived. 
After the prince sentenced the prisoners to death, what did the princess do? Uh, I do not understand what you mean. Is it true she went to visit them? Yes. Yes, she did. And were you with her? I was asked to wait outside the cell. Why? I do not know. Has she often asked you to wait outside when she's speaking with people? Sometimes. Often? Not often. Then what happened? She called for monks to give last rites to the murderers. She called for monks? Her father is murdered, and she is concerned about the murderer's souls? Why did she call for two monks? Was one not sufficient to do the job for both? For that matter, why not call the castle priest? I do not know. And did she also order the murderers unchained? Yes, to be able to kneel. And when the monks entered the cell, did you go with them? No, again she asked me to remain outside. So the monks could enter, but not her trusted bodyguard. Not even when the known killers of her father were unchained and free? Hmm. Then what? She came out of the cell. She wanted me to stay behind and escort the monks to the kitchens after they were done giving last rites. Why? She did not say. Did you ask? No, sir. As a man at arms, it is not my place to question the orders from a member of the royal family. I see. But were you pleased with these orders? No. Why? I was fearful more assassins might be in the castle, and I did not wish the princess to be out of my sight. In point of fact, wasn't Captain Wyland in the process of searching the castle for additional threats, and didn't he make everyone aware he felt the castle was unsafe? He did. Did the princess explain to you where she was going, so you could find her after performing your duty to the monks? No. I see. And how do you know the two you escorted to the kitchens were the monks? Did you see their faces? Their hoods were up. Did they have their hoods up when they entered the cell? Hilfred thought a moment and then shook his head. I do not think so. So, on a night when her father is killed, she orders her personal bodyguard to leave her unprotected and to escort two monks down to the empty kitchens. Two monks who decided suddenly to pull their hoods up inside the castle, hiding their faces? And what about the murderer's possessions? Where were they? They were in the custody of the cell warden. And what did she say to the warden concerning them? She told him she was going to have the monks take them for the poor. And did they take them? Yes. Hmm. Reuben, you do not strike me as a fool. Fools don't rise to the rank and position you have achieved. When you heard the killers escaped and the monks were found chained in their place, did it cross your mind that maybe the princess had arranged it? I assumed the killers attacked the monks after the princess left the cell. You did not answer my question. I ask if it crossed your mind. Reuben said nothing. Did it? Perhaps, but only briefly. Let us turn our attention to more recent events. Were you present during the conversation between Arista and her uncle in his study? Yes, but I was asked to wait outside. To wait just outside the door, correct? Yes. Therefore, could you hear what transpired inside? Yes. Is it true the princess entered the Archduke's office, where he was diligently working at locating the prince, and informed him that Prince Ulrich was clearly dead, and that no search was needed, that he would make a better use of his time. The lawyer turned to face the nobles. To begin preparations for her coronation as our queen. I do not remember her using those words. Did she or did she not indicate the Archduke should stop looking for Ulrich? Yes. And did she threaten the Archduke, insinuating she would soon hold her coronation, and once she was queen, he might find he was no longer the Lord Chancellor? I... I believe she did say something to that effect, 
But she was angry. That will be all, Sergeant at Arms. That is all I asked. You can step down. Hilfred began to leave the witness box. Oh, 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 I... I am sorry. Just one last thing. Have you ever seen or heard the princess cry over the loss of her father or brother? She is a very private woman. Yes or no? Hilfred hesitated. No, I have not. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. The lawyer turned to the bleachers as Hilfred returned to his seat in the galleys. I am sure you are as perplexed as I was. Many of you know her. How could this sweet girl attack her own father and brother? Was it just to gain a throne? It is not like her, is it? I ask you to bear with me. The reason should become quite clear in a moment. The court calls Bishop Solder to testify. Eyes from the gallery swept the room, looking for the cleric, as the old man slowly stood up from his seat and approached the witness box. Your Grace, you have been in this castle on many occasions. You know the royal family extremely well. Can you shed some light on Her Highness's motivations? Gentlemen, I have watched over the royal family for years, and this recent tragedy is heartbreaking and dreadful. The accusation the Archduke brings against the princess is painful to my ears, for I feel almost like a grandfather to the poor girl. However, I cannot hide the truth, which is, she is dangerous. I can assure each of you, she is no longer the sweet innocent child whom I used to hold in my arms. I have seen her, spoken to her, watched her in her grief, or rather the lack of grief for her father and brother. I can tell you truly, her lust for knowledge and power has caused her to fall into the arms of evil. The bishop paused, dropping his head into his hands and shaking it. He looked up with a remorse-filled face. It's the result of what happens when a woman is educated and, in Arista's case, introduced to the wicked powers of black magic. I knew it! Percy Braga observed the audience with satisfaction from his seat at the rear of the magistrates. The faces of the gentry were filling with anger. He had successfully coaxed the spark into a flame, and the flame would soon be ablaze. In the crowd, he spotted Wylan moving in the wings toward him. We have them, my lord. They are gagged and locked in the dungeon, a little banged up by two of my overzealous men, but alive. Excellent. And has there been any movement on the roads? Has there been any indication nobles loyal to the traitor Arista may attack? I don't know, sir. I came directly from the sewers. Very well. Get to the gate and sound the horn if you see anything. I'm concerned there may be an assault from Pickering of Drundle Fields. Oh, and if you see that wretched little dwarf, tell him it's time to bring the princess down. Of course, your lordship. Wyland pulled a small parchment rolled into a tube from his tabard. I was past this on my way in. It just arrived via messenger addressed to you. Braga took the missive from Wylan, and the master-at-arms left with a bow. Braga grinned at the ease of it all. He wondered if the princess in her distant tower prison could sense her coming death. Her own beloved citizens would soon be begging, nay, demanding, her execution. He had yet to present the storeroom administrator who would attest to the stolen dagger that had later been found in Arista's possession. And then, of course, there were now the thieves. He would hold them until the last, and drag them out to the floor, gagged and chained. The mere sight of them was likely to start a riot. The magistrates would have no choice but to rule against Arista, and grant him the throne. He would still have to deal with the possibility of Ulrichs attacking, but that could not be helped now. He was certain he would defeat Ulrich. Several of his more disgruntled eastern lords had already agreed to join him the moment he was crowned king. Once the trial was complete and Arista dead, he planned to hold the coronation. By the next day, he would marshal the kingdom. Ulrich would cease to be a prince and become a fugitive. The court calls storage.
Court's clerk, Klein Rues, who was in charge of keeping the knife used to kill the king. <laughs> More damning evidence. Braga unrolled the scroll that Wyland had presented him. It had no seal, no emblem of nobility, only a simple string tie. He read the message, which was as simple as its package. You missed us in the sewers. We now have the princess. Your time is growing short. The Archduke crumpled the note in his fist and glared around at the numerous faces in the crowd, wondering if whoever had written it was watching him. His heart began beating faster, and he stood up slowly, trying not to draw attention to himself. The lawyer caught sight of his movement and gave him a curious look. Braga dismissed his concern with a slight wave of his hand. He left the court, forcing himself to walk slowly and calmly. The moment he passed through the chamber doors and out of sight of the crowd, he trotted through the castle halls, his cape whipping behind him. In his fist, he held on to the note, crushing it. It isn't possible. It can't be. Hearing footfalls approaching rapidly from behind, he stopped and spun, drawing his sword. Is there a problem, Braga? Archibald Ballantyne held his hands up defensively before the point of the Archduke's blade. Braga threw the crumpled note at him and resumed his march toward the dungeon. The Earl of Chadwick ran after Braga. Okay, it's those thieves! Those damned thieves! They're demons! Magicians! Evil mages! They're like smoke appearing and disappearing at will! Archibald caught up with Braga, and they descended the stairs to the detention block. My lord, I... Open the cell to the prisoners Wyland's men just brought in. Do it now. Yes, my lord. Fumbling with his great ring of keys, the warden moved quickly to the cell hall. Two castle guards stood watch to either side of a door and promptly stepped aside at his approach. Have you two been here since the prisoners were brought in? The guard on the left nodded. Aye, my lord. Captain Wyland ordered us to stand guard and allow absolutely no admittance to anyone except him or you. Very good. Braga turned to the warden. Open it. The warden unlocked the door and entered the cell. Inside, Braga saw two men chained to the wall, stripped to their waists with gags in their mouths. They were not the same men he had seen the night of the king's murder. Warden, remove the gags. Yes, sir. Who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> My name's Bindent, your lordship. I'm just a street sweeper from Kirby's End. Honest, we, we weren't doing nothing wrong. What were you two doing in the sewers under this castle? <laughs> the other one looked piteously at Braga. Hunting rats, sir. Rats? Yes, sir. Honest we was. We was told there was a big event here in the castle this morning, and the castle kitchen was complaining about rats climbing up from the sewers. Because of the cold, you see, sir. We was told we'd get paid a silver tenant for every rat we done killed. Only... Only what? Only we never seen no rats, your lordship. Before we found any, we were knocked out by soldiers and brought here. Archibald turned to Braga. See? What did I tell you? They took her already. They stole her right from under your nose, just like they took my letters. They couldn't have. There's no way to get up to Arista's tower. It's too high and it can't be climbed. I'm telling you, Braga, these men are skilled. They scaled my grey tower well enough, and it's one of the tallest there is. Trust me, Archibald, Arista's tower can't be climbed. But they did it. I didn't think it was possible when they did it to me either. Not until I opened the safe and my prize was gone. Now your price is gone, and what will you do with that crowd out there when you have no princess to burn? It's just not possible. Braga pushed Ballantyne out of his way as he walked out of the cell. Guards, come with me and bring one of those gags. It's time the princess came down for her court appearance. Yes, sir. Braga led them through the castle and up six flights of stairs to the residence level. The hallway here was empty. All the servants were gathered with the others, listening to the proceedings of the trial. They passed the royal chapel and continued up the hallway to the next door. Braga threw it open. Magnus! Inside, a dwarf with a braided brown beard and a broad, flat nose lay on a bed. He was dressed in a blue leather vest, large black boots, and a bright orange puffed sleeve shirt that made his arms appear huge. As it time? Hopping off the bed, the dwarf yawned and rubbed his eyes. 
Is there any chance someone could have gotten up in her tower and stolen Arista out of there? None whatsoever. Braga looked back and forth between Ballantyne and the dwarf, scowling. I have to know for certain. Besides, she needs to come down for the burning, and I must get back to the trial. You'll have to fetch her. Take these guards with you. One of them has a gag. Make sure they use it before bringing her down. The Archduke turned to the guards. The princess has been corrupted by dark magic. She's a witch and can play tricks with your mind, so don't let her talk to you. Get her and bring her to the court. The guards nodded, and the dwarf led them down the hallway in the direction of the tower. Archibald, go get Wylan. He's stationed at the castle gate. Tell him to come to the royal residence wing and provide assistance guarding the princess. I can't take any chances. Do you understand me? Oh, do as you say, Percy, but I'm sure she is already gone. These bastards are incredible. They're like ghosts, and they have no fear at all. They work right under your nose, steal you blind, and then have the audacity to send you a note telling you what they have done. Braga paused and thought. Yes, why did they do that? If they took her, why let me know? And if they didn't, they must have suspected I would immediately check to... He glanced over his shoulder in the direction the dwarf had gone, and turned back to Archibald. Get Wylan up here now! Braga ran up the hallway, following the dwarf and the two guards. They were just entering the north corridor, which led directly to the tower, when he caught up to them. Stop where you are! The dwarf turned around with a puzzled expression on his face. The guards responded differently. The larger of the two pivoted, drawing his sword, and moved to block the Archduke's passage. Time to move, Royce. Hadrian cast off his helm. The standard-issue sword of the castle guard felt heavy and awkward in his grip. Royce removed his helm as well as he moved past the dwarf, running quickly down the hall. Stop him, you fool! The dwarf was too slow to react. The thief was already far down the hall, and the small dwarf ran after him. Braga drew his own sword and turned his attention to Hadrian. Do you know who I am? I know we met in the dungeon recently when you were hanging in chains, but are you aware of my reputation? I'm Archduke Percy Braga, Lord Chancellor of Melengar, and, more importantly, the winner of the title of Grand Circuit Tournament Swordsmaster for the last five years in a row. Do you have any titles? Any awards bestowed? Are there trophies shelved for your handling of a sword? I have bested the best in Avron, even the famous Pickering and his magic rapier. The way I heard it, he didn't have his sword the day you two dueled. <laughs> that sword story is just that, a legend. He uses it as an excuse to account for his losses, or when he is afraid of an opponent. His sword is just a common rapier with a fancy hilt. Braga moved in and swiped at Hadrian in a savagely fast attack that drove him backward. He struck again, and Hadrian had to leap backward to avoid being slashed across the chest. You're fast. That's good. It'll make this more interesting. You see, Mr. Thief, I'm sure you have the situation all wrong. You may be under the impression that you are holding me at bay while your friend races to rescue the damsel in distress. How noble for a commoner like yourself. You must entertain dreams of being a knight to be so idealistic. Braga lunged and dipped. Hadrian fell back again, and once more, Braga smiled. <laughs> the truth is, you are not holding me at all. I'm holding you. The Archduke fainted left and then short-stroked toward Hadrian's body. He dodged the attack, but it put him off balance and off guard. Braga punched the hilt of his sword hard into Hadrian's face, throwing him back against the corridor wall. His lip began to bleed. Immediately, Braga lashed out again, but Hadrian had moved, and the Archduke's sword sparked across the stone wall. Oh, that looked like it hurt. <laughs> I've had worse. I must admit, you two have been quite impressive. Your reputation is certainly well earned. It was very clever of you to slip into the sewers behind those rat catchers and use them as decoys. It was also intelligent of you to send that note causing me to direct you right to the princess, but your genius ended there. You see, I can kill you whenever I want. But I want you alive. I need at least one person to execute. The mob will insist on that. In a few moments, Wylan and a dozen guards will come up here, and you'll be taken to the stake. Meanwhile, your friend, whom you are sure is rescuing Arista, will be the instrument of her death, and his as well. 
You could run and warn him, but, oh, that's right, you're keeping me at bay, aren't you? Braga grinned and attacked again. <laughs> Royce reached a door at the end of the hall and was not surprised to find it locked. He pulled his tools from his belt. The lock was traditional, and he had no trouble picking it. The door swung open, but immediately Royce knew something was wrong. He felt, more than heard, a click as the door pulled back. His instincts told him something was not right. He looked up the spiral stairs that disappeared around the circle of the tower. Nothing looked amiss, but years of experience told him otherwise. He tentatively put a foot on the first step and nothing happened. He moved to the second and the third, inching his way up. Listening for any telltale sounds, he searched for wires, levers, and loose tiles. Everything appeared safe. Behind him, down the hallway, he could hear the faint sounds of swordplay as Hadrian entertained the Archduke. He needed to hurry. He moved up five more steps. There were small windows, no more than three feet tall and only a foot wide, just enough to allow light to pass through but nothing else. The winter sun revealed the staircase in a washed-out brilliance. Weight, rather than mortar, held the smooth stone walls together. The steps were likewise made of solid blocks of stone, also fitted with amazing artisanship, so that a sheet of parchment could not slip between the cracks. Royce moved up to the ninth step, and as he shifted his weight to the higher stone block, the tower shook. In reaction, he instinctively started to step back, and then it happened. The previous eight steps collapsed. They broke and fell out of sight into an abyss below him. Royce shifted his weight forward again just in time to avoid falling to his death and took another off-balance step upward. The moment he did, the previous step broke away and fell. The tower rumbled again. Your first mistake was picking the lock. Royce turned and saw the dwarf standing just outside the door in the castle's corridor. He stood there, spinning a door key tied to a string around his index finger, winding and unwinding it. He absently stroked the hair of his beard. If you open the door without using the key, it engages the trap. The dwarf began to pace slowly before the open door like a professor addressing a class. You can't jump the hole you made to get back here. It's already too far. And in case you're wondering, the bottom is a long way down. You started climbing this tower on the sixth floor of the castle, and the base of the tower extends to the bedrock below the foundation. I also added plenty of jagged rocks at the bottom, just for fun. You made this? <laughs> of course! Well, not the tower. It was here already. I spent the last half year hollowing it out like a stone-eaten termite. The dwarf grinned. There's very little material left in it. All those solid-looking blocks of rock you see are parchment thin. I left just the right amount of structure in place. The inside looks like a spider web made of stone rather than thread. Tiny strands of rock in the latticework of a classic crystalline matrix. Strong enough to hold the tower up, but extremely fragile if the right thread is broken. And I take it each time I take a step up, the previous one will fall? The dwarf's grin widened. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? You can't go down, but if you go up, you get into an even worse situation. The steps work as a horizontal support for the vertical planes. Without the steps to steady the structure, it will twist on itself and fall. Before you reach the top, the entire tower will collapse once enough supports fall away. <laughs> You've already weakened the structure to where it might fall on its own now. Oh, I can hear it with the blowing of the wind, the tiny little cracks and pops. All stone makes sound as it grows, shrinks, twists, or erodes. It's a language I understand very well. It tells me stories of the past and of the future. And right now, this tower is singing. Royce looked grimly up the staircase. I hate dwarves. The water pitcher and basin hit the floor and shattered. 
The crash jolted Arista, who sat on her bed, disoriented and confused. The room was shaking. All summer, the tower had felt strange, but nothing like this. She held her breath, waiting. Nothing happened. The tower stopped moving. Tentatively, she slipped off the bed, crept gingerly toward the windows, and looked out. She saw nothing to explain the tremor. Outside, the world was blanketed white by a fresh layer of snow that was still falling, and she wondered if it was snow sliding from the tower's eaves that made the room shake. It did not seem likely, nor did that matter. How much time do I have left? She looked down. The crowd still circled the front gate of the castle. There must have been more than a hundred people there, all pressing for news of her trial. Around the perimeter of the castle, three times the usual number of guards patrolled in full armor. Her uncle was not taking any chances. Perhaps he thought the people of the city might rise up against him rather than see their princess burned. She knew better. No one cared if she lived or died. While she knew all the lords, earls, and barons by name, and had sat down with them for dozens of meals, she knew they were not her friends. She did not have any friends. Braga was right. She spent too much time in her tower. No one really knew her. She lived a solitary life, but this was the first time she ever really felt alone. She had spent all night trying to determine exactly what words she would use when brought before the court. In the end, she concluded there was little she could do or say. She could accuse Braga of the murder of her father, but she had no proof. He was the one with all the evidence on his side. After all, she had released the two thieves and was responsible for Ulrich's disappearance. What was I thinking? She had handed her brother over to two unknown thugs. Ulrich had personally explained his intent to torture them, and she had left him to their mercy. Arista felt sick whenever she imagined them laughing at her expense as they drowned poor Ulrich in the river. Now they were likely halfway to Calais or Delgos, taking turns wearing the royal signet ring of Melengar. When the scouts had returned with Ulrich's robes, she had been certain he was dead. And yet, there was no body. Is it possible Ulrich still lives? No, she reasoned. It was far more likely Braga kept Ulrich's corpse hidden. Revealing it before her trial would allow her to make a bid for the throne. Once the trial was over, once she was found guilty and burned, he would miraculously reveal its discovery. It was very possible Braga had Ulrich's body locked away in one of the rooms below her, or somewhere in the vault. <sighs> it was all her fault. If she had not interfered, perhaps Ulrich might have taken charge and discovered Braga's treachery. Perhaps he could have saved both of them. Perhaps she was nothing more than a foolish girl after all. At least her death would put an end to the questions and the guilt consuming her. She closed her eyes and once more felt the unsteadiness of the world around her. The Galilean host was now a full 500 strong as it marched through the wintry landscape. Sixty knights dressed in full armor carried lances adorned with long forked banners. They flicked like serpents' tongues in the numbing wind. At the head of the line rode Prince Ulrich, Myron, Count Pickering, and his two eldest sons, as well as the land-titled nobles. Following them were the knights, who rode together in rows four abreast. An entourage of squires, pages, and footmen traveled behind them. Farther back were the ranks of the common men-at-arms, strong, stocky brutes dressed in chain and steel with pointed helms, plate metal shin guards, and metal shank boots. Each was equipped with a kite shield, a short, broad blade sword, and a long spear. Next in line were the archers in leather jerkins and woolen cloaks that hid their quivers. They marched holding their unstrung bows as if they were mere walking sticks. At the rear came the artisans, smiths, surgeons, and cooks, pulling wagons that hauled the army's supplies. Myron felt foolish. He was starting to get the hang of the stirrups, but he still had much to learn. After hours on the road, he was still having trouble keeping his horse from veering to the left into Fannin's gelding. Oh. Fannin smiled patiently at the monk. You need to be more firm. Show her who's in charge. She already knows. She is... 
<sighs> I think I should just stick with the reins. It's not like I'll be wielding a sword and shield in the coming battle. You never know. Monks of old used to fight a lot, and Ulrich said you helped save his life by fighting against those mercenaries who attacked him in the forest. Myron frowned and dropped his gaze. I didn't fight anyone. But I thought... Myron shook his head. I should have, I suppose. They were the ones who burned the abbey. They were the ones who killed... But... Uh... I would have died if Hadrian and Royce hadn't saved me. The king just assumed that I fought, and I never bothered to tell the truth. I really have to stop doing that. Doing what? Lying. That's not lying. You just didn't correct him. It amounts to the same thing. The abbot once told me that lying was a betrayal to oneself. It's evidence of self-loathing. When you are so ashamed of your actions, thoughts, or intentions, you lie, rather than accepting yourself for who you really are. Or in this case, pretend something happened when it didn't. The idea of how others see you becomes more important than the reality of you. It's like when a man would rather die than be thought of as a coward. His life is not as important to him as his reputation. In the end, who is braver? The man who dies rather than be thought of as a coward? Or the man who lives, willing to face who he really is. Fanon gave Myron a quizzical look. I'm sorry, you lost me there. It doesn't matter. But the prince asked me along as a chronicler of events, not as a warrior. I think he wants me to record what happens today in a book. Well, if you do, please leave out the way Denek threw a fit at not being allowed to come. It will reflect poorly on our family. Everything they passed was new to Myron. He had seen snow, of course, but only in the courtyard and cloister at the abbey. He had never seen how it settled on a forest or glittered on the edges of rivers and streams. They were traveling through populated country now, passing village after village, each one larger than the one before. Myron could only stare in fascination at the many different types of buildings, animals, and people he saw along the way. Each time they came into a town, the villagers came out to stare at them. Children ran to the edge of the road, where parents quickly pulled them back. Myron had never seen a child before, at least not since he had been one. It was not uncommon for a boy to be sent to the abbey at ten or twelve, but rarely, if ever, was one sent before the age of eight. The smallest of the children fascinated Myron, and he watched them in amazement. They were like short, drunk people, loud and unusually dirty, but all were surprisingly cute and looked at him in much the same way that he looked at them. They would wave, and Myron could not help waving back, although he assumed it was not very soldierly to do so. The war host moved surprisingly fast. The foot soldiers, responding in unison to orders, alternated between periods of double-time marching and a more relaxed stride, which was only slightly slower. Each of them wore a grim face without a smile among them. For hours they marched. No one interfered. There were no advance formations lying in ambush, no challenges along the road. To Myron, the trip felt more like an exciting parade than the preparation for an ominous battle. Finally, he saw his first glimpse of Melengar in the distance. Look, Myron, Fanon pointed. There's the great bell tower of Mare's Cathedral. It's beautiful. A vanguard rode up to Ulrich and Pickering. My lords, a strong force is entrenched around the city. Form ranks! Flags relayed messages, archers strung their bows, and the army transformed themselves into blocks of men. In long lines of three across, they moved as one. The archers were summoned forward and moved ahead just behind the foot soldiers. Ulrich swung his horse toward Myron and Fanon. Get to the rear! They rode with the cooks to watch and listen. From his new vantage point, Myron noticed part of the army had broken away from the main line and was moving to the right side of the city. When the ranks of men reached the rise, which left them visible to the castle walls, a great horn sounded in the distance. One of their own answered the castle horn, and the Galilean archers released a barrage of arrows upon the defenders. The shafts flew and appeared to hang briefly in the air like a dark cloud. Come on, then! 
When they heard the horn, Mason, Grumman, and Dixon Taft led their mob up Wayward Street, effectively emptying the lower quarter. It was the sign Royce and Hadrian had told them to wait for, the signal to attack. Ever since the two thieves had woken them up in the middle of the night, they had spent their time organizing the resistance in the lower quarter of Medford. They spread the news of Amrath's assassination by the Archduke, of the innocence of the princess, and of the return of the prince. Those not moved by loyalty or justice were enticed by the chance to strike back at their betters. It was not difficult to convince the poor and the destitute to take up arms against the soldiery who policed them. In addition, there were those hoping for a possibility to do a little looting, or perhaps receive some reward from the crown if they prevailed. They armed themselves with pitchforks, axes, and clubs. Makeshift armor was constructed by strapping whatever thin metal they could find under their clothing. In most cases, this meant commandeering a baking sheet from their wives. They had the numbers, but they looked like a pathetic lot. Gwen had roused the artisan quarter, which provided not only strong workers, but a few swords, bows, and bits of armor. With the city guards ordered to the perimeter and most of the gentry quarter at the trial, there was no one to stop them from openly organizing. With Dixon at his side, Mason marched at the head of the commoner procession, his smithing hammer in one hand and a rough-hewn shield he had beaten together that morning in the other. Neither he nor Dixon was a warrior, or even athletic, but they were large men with broad chests and thick necks, and the crowd followed behind them as if the citizens of the lower quarter were plowing the city with a pair of yoked oxen. They turned onto Wayward Street and marched unchallenged into the gentry quarter. Compared to the lower quarter, it was like another world. The streets were paved with decorative tile work and lined with metal horse hitches. Along the avenue, enclosed street lamps and covered sewers accentuated the care taken for the comfort of the privileged few. Marking the center of the gentry quarter was a large, spacious square. The great Essendon Fountain, with its statue of Tolan on a rearing horse above the pluming water, was its main landmark. Across from it, Mare's Cathedral rose, and its towers high above, bells chimed loudly. They passed the fine three-story stone and brick houses with their iron fences and decorative gates. That the stables here looked better than the house Mason lived in was not lost on him. The trip through the square only added fuel to the fire that was sweeping across the city. When they reached Main Street, they saw the enemy.